Hello guys and welcome to the April update here on Mitchie's Esport Diaries and guys March has been an incredible month we've had so many things uh, to talk about so many things that we've we, we've done in that month so uh, yeah we're going to start first with uh, the esports season overview with the updates virtual endurance championship and FSR before we have a closer look into what the world of sim racing has um, released for us what kind of updates were out there in the overall sim racing community so let's start first with formula sim racing then um, in March and 1st of April we had, oh, up to, until 1st of April we had two races. We had the Australian Grand Prix in the mid of March and end of March the German Grand Prix, the home Grand Prix. And uh, I know there was one video uh, published by Formula Sim Racing that uh, kind of said, yeah, we had a bad season 2022. I gotta really say that this season is not going too well either, which has multiple reasons, um, most of them being personally, um, another one being maybe the fact that it, it doesn't, I, I simply do not invest enough time, uh, besides the fact that probably, as in last year as well, I have my small difficulties and issues with the car overall, so not really being able to 100% extract the pace out of the car um, as I would probably be able to do with other cars or as I'm generally able to do in, in the world of R-Fact 2. Um, and at the same time, I need to be honest that, especially for round two and round three, I haven't really put in the efforts. That's... Maybe just talk about round two first and then for round three. So round two, the Australian Grand Prix uh, started 18th, finished seven post-race penalties, got us P9. And um, I'm actually very happy with that P7. Um, and don't get me wrong, this is not my ambition to finish seventh or somewhere in the top 10 and be happy with that. It's just when you consider, when I personally consider all the circumstances um, around that mm, yeah, that created that result, so to say. So let's face it, for Australia, I did a race sim. I did a couple of long runs. I wasn't really happy with the, with the um, mid to late stint balance, I want to call it. Um, first seven, six, eight laps of every stint, all good, all fine car stable but then in the high speed chicane and also in the exits out of the low speed turns as soon as the tire aged to lap 9 and 10 the car got extremely loose extremely um, difficult to to anticipate I want to say I, I never really have the feeling for the car and I tried working most of the time trying to fix that issue getting getting fast enough getting stable enough and I think you even saw mid-race that I had my good struggles late in the stint, especially in the fast chicane, turn 10, turn 11, where the rear end just so easily, was so, snapping so easily. Um, and that is what I focused most on in the limited time of practice that I did. Um, that for qualifying, I don't know, for qualifying I did like an hour of practice or something and it, it just simply didn't click. It I couldn't get up to speed. I couldn't get the performance of my teammates in. Yane was so quick. Like I, he was really half a second faster than me. And to some extent, I was like, hey, you know what? It's Saturday afternoon. It's Saturday night. Um, it is what it is. And uh, this is what has got me P15 in Bahrain in the quali, P18 in Australia for the qualifying. And generally speaking, I only did like five or maybe six hours of practice in total for Formula Sim Racing for the second race, including all the simulations and analyzer stuff, which is nowhere near the amount that I did for 2020, 2021 and so on. Um, it's currently simply a time constraint uh, with the streaming being my kind of priority for this year to a certain extent. Um, and with that said, the overall race, though, 
was absolutely great. Yes, I did that mistake. I, I had that incident with sending Reuven wide. I'm kind of sorry about that. Uh, sorry, but not sorry. Either way, I got a penalty for it and I'm just simply accepting it because like according to the rules, I was at fault there and I respect that. Um, generally speaking though, despite starting 18th, we finished, I think, just some odd 26 seconds off the lead in P9 and P7 apparently. It was very good racing, very good decision making, awesome strategy, awesome performance. Yeah, we capitalized on some other people having some argy bargy, but still, uh, sometimes that's part of the game. So, to sum the Australian Grand Prix up, very unhappy with qualifying performance, but not surprised. Very happy with the race performance, even being a little bit surprised because I felt I did better in the actual race than much better than I anticipated from practice. So that was a good one. And then let's move to round three, German Grand Prix. Um, for whatever reason, that went particularly well if you consider the qualifying because um, I did a little bit more practice for qualifying for that round. But generally speaking, I did two sessions. I did Wednesday a session and I think Saturday afternoon, one hour, was it even Sunday morning? I can't remember. Um, either way, like it was the least amount of practice I've ever put in for a Formula Sim racing race. Um, and interestingly enough, if you count out the spin that I did last lap in the race, I would have finished 16 seconds off P1 in still P9 in the end. I think Alex Siebel would have gotten me anyway, even if I didn't spin in the last lap. Um, as a matter of fact, though, and this is actually a bad example, just to two, two or three hours of practice for Formula Sim Racing, yet still finish in, the, in, in P9. I take two things away from that. One is that for some reason, sometimes the car clicks absolutely nice and I kind of be, can be good with it. And it also means that maybe on that day we had a superior setup, generally speaking, because Yane was lightning, lightning quick, uh, put it on pole or P2 in qualifying. Uh, so we were, we were much closer to the very top end in qualifying as well, uh, which probably made the race more, uh, more easy. And then strategy, uh, we saw two stop strategies, four stop strategies, we had a three stop strategy. So that was an interesting one regarding the strategies as well. But as a matter of fact, um, it also means that in hindsight, the, le the, the less I prepare, the better I am. And we completely cut that across. That is certainly not the case. I think it was a, a lucky circumstance of things. Um, generally speaking, I want to put more effort into, in, into the race preparation. Now for Singapore ahead, I actually I would need to do more preparation. But yeah, as it is Monday already, I've not done a single lap to date um yeah so things are circling um in, in in the same pattern again which is a bit unfortunate i guess um because of course like it's three races three times ninth place surprisingly we're sitting ninth in the championship um but yeah like you see it in my face, right? Ninth in the championship is not really our ambitions and is also not really displaying our actual skill level. However, with a limited amount of time and putting it into the series, I think the, the result is reasonably good. Um, it's just not enough to really climb higher and that is what I need to take away from those two races uh, in March. But yeah, it is what it is actually. Um, moving on to the Virtual Endurance Championship, we've had the, the Thousand Miles of Sebring and uh, just yesterday, uh, Saturday, the um, Four Hours of Silverstone and it's a bit of a painful one because for those of you that have seen the Thousand Miles of Sebring, I've desperately tried to regain third position in that Thousand Miles after we fled it in the, the first three hours. Then um, Thomas was in the car, he didn't quite feel as comfortable. I maybe also made the mistake to, to, to be away in that time. Uh, you know, when you are working eight to five, some things need to be done 
on Saturday, like purchases and stuff. Um, certainly not optimal to leave him alone for two or three hours, but I, I had to do it. Uh, when we came back in the car, though, one point four minutes of gap, like a minute and 20 or so, it was simply too much. I couldn't make this up in the last two and a half hours of, of, of driving. Um, we finished fourth, which is not displaying our actual pace performance that we've had in the car. Um, yet the car was the, the usual five or six tenth of what, what race leaders were doing in, in Diff 1, maybe even seven or eight tenths. It was in, in Sebring, I don't know, I was not too unhappy with the setup. I, was, I, I don't think it was too bad overall, but it certainly wasn't optimal. And um, I, I feel more and more like Mercedes in real F1 there. Like I set up the car with a kind of good balance for me, well, with a kind of good balance for us. Sometimes it's okay-ish quick, sometimes it's really slow, sometimes we're really struggling, sometimes we're kind of good in the race pace. Um, Sebring was certainly one where the one lap pace and qualifying looked all right, but in the race we were lacking that two or three tens and the stability over the bumps and the high speed rotation and general stability with the rear end, stuff like that. Um, so it was a tricky to drive car nonetheless. Um, and yeah, P4 felt like a really bad defeat on that day. I remember that I've been really, really unhappy with that P4, I haven't had a grief at, at, at teammate Thomas. Thomas did as good as he could possibly do in that day. I knew beforehand, like, he had limited time on preparation. He had also a big question mark whether he'd actually be able to race at all, which was a major concern. So I won't blame him for being P4. I rather would blame me stepping away, leaving him alone, probably with a, uh, with a little bit of, live coaching so to say uh, or with a live guidance and engineering we would have perhaps saved a couple of seconds here or there whether it would have ultimately changed before in the end i don't know um i don't think so um so yeah we just tick the box behind it leave it behind and um we looked forward then to um the four hours of silverstone silverstone personally a track that I absolutely love. Um, I'm, I'm a really big fan of Silverstone and I really looked forward to those four hours, which sadly again, just like FSR round three, resulted into even less preparation for that race. Um, I did a session on Wednesday before the race where I felt absolutely horrendous had no time on Thursday. Then on Friday, I was like, okay, let's at least try to get a stint in. That didn't go too well. Um, however, we found a couple of clicks that made the car a bit more predictable, a bit more balanced overall. And I actually found a way to say, okay, if I underdrive the car, if I drive the car in a certain way, um, then we're actually going to be fine. And suddenly I was comparing those, those one lap shots that I did, that one lap pace, um, against the leaderboard on, on the Virtual Endurance Championship. And I was like, hell yeah, we're quick. We're not that slow. We are literally just three or four tenths of the fastest car in Def 1. And that is usually like not the case. Usually on an even shorter lap time, we lack half a second, six, seven tenths sometimes maybe. But uh, on, on a really good lap, if we really, really nailed it, uh, I think we have been close to being on par, yet two or three tenths off the pace. And I was like, Jesus, I have no idea why, but the car is working and we have some pace here. And that does display perfectly in the race. Obviously, we profited from the race clutch car having a stop and go penalty for activities from Sebring. Um, but as a matter of fact, once they were off, and we had the clean air in P1, we could we could build a gap. Like I pulled a gap of one and a half minutes within a two and a half hour drive. Um, not entirely one and a half minutes, but minute and 10-ish. Um, probably a minute and a half if you consider the fact that I have fueled up on the code 80, trying to maximize my driving time and minimize Thomas' 
driving time because again he had difficulties with putting in the practice as well and I was like okay uh, we rather take me being a second slower rather than have him in the car maybe be two seconds slower um, so I tried limiting the damage and then unlike Sebring I just quickly got the stuff done that I had to do for the Saturday and uh, got back into the the rig trying to do some life coaching on traffic trying to guide him through the race that was a much better team effort we did um yesterday um saturday but um ultimately we've won that race with 30 seconds to spare and honestly i almost forgot about how it feels winning an endurance race uh yesterday i was really thrilled i really had a great time and um, I'm, I'm really, really happy about that that race. And now we need to see, because of that P4 in Sebring instead of a P3, we missed out on a relegation. Although I'm kind of hoping that Papa Jimmy decides to put a couple of more LMH ups in, into, LMP, into Diff 1. Because otherwise we do a 24-hour race in Le Mans with four entries, five entries. Um yeah, whether that is smart to do, whether that is reasonable to do it like that, I put that question to elsewhere. Um, but whatever they decide is probably going to be what is going to happen. And well, once it's out, what happens with our entry, we need to see how we how we are going to prepare for the race and how we're actually going to conduct that in the race. But that is future music, happens in 2nd of June. Um, so you guys are going to look forward to that. In the entry of this eSport diary, I have uh, spoken about the fact, the updates to the world of sim racing. And there is two major updates that we've had in March, which was one, iRacing introduced their rain feature, which has been anticipated by the player base for like months and years. And on the other hand, Assetto Corsa Competizione released their version of the Nordschleife at the Nürburgring. And um, we've obviously done streams on both things. And I just want to briefly talk about how great iRacing has nailed the, the rain and its dynamics in terms of it is a thing unique in the world of sim racing that... Um, a wet driving line is particularly faster and particularly more grippy compared to a dry driving line. Um, it's not working in R Factor 2. I'm not quite sure if it works in ACC like that. I think Assetto Corsa Competizione is still like on the main racing line. You would probably find the fastest way around a wet track as well. Um, Assetto Corsa has more of the issue with the tire temperatures and tire pressures than when it comes to rain and wet driving. Um, so iRacing has nailed that or has got that extremely right. Um, in my opinion, just at the cost of like reality. Um, as much as that is dynamic and as much as you change your racing line, we've done that one video at Spa. I'm not sure if it is like that on the other tracks, but... If you have the right graphic settings, you can clearly see the path going around the track with where the rubber is, which where you find lower grip, and you can clearly see the path um, to follow where you find the higher grips, where you need to anticipate that um, that that line. I want to say, and I'm not sure if it's like that in the real world. I think in the real world, drivers have to feel and have to guess where they find the, the most grip, right? Uh, it's not like they can clearly see, oh yeah, that is the racing line and that is clearly offline, so I'm gonna clearly take the offline, uh, which is what you have to do in ACC uh, in, in iRacing. So um, I think the system or that feature got a little bit of a flaw there. But generally speaking, the spray is insane. Um, you can't see a single thing. Whether that is like that in real life as well, I cannot judge. Um, the only thing I can judge though is 
when I go down the motorway, hundreds kph, and it really pulls down heavily, um, then the amount of water coming towards the windscreen makes it really difficult to see just 20, 25 meters ahead. But obviously in racing, we don't speak about 20 or 25 meters. It's more like maybe five to 10 meters of anything, if even that much. Sometimes it's only 50 centimeters if cars are side by side or close to each other going for the draft and the slipstream. So it's hard to compare that in the first place. And then secondly, if you have those conditions where you can't see 25 meters wide on, on the autobahn or on, on like general roads, then there is so much water that's coming down that is a red flag condition anyway for safety reasons. So mm. I'm not sure if iRacing has maybe overdone that a little bit on that point. But um, I think, once again, what you really need to appreciate from iRacing is that you have to take racing lines to really be quick when it pulls down. And um, generally speaking, it is also interesting, you know, different tire compounds. Um, the dry tire doesn't work at all in the wet, so that is accurate and correct. Um, the puddles where they are forming, the way they are forming, the way they are behaving, you really aquaplan over those puddles. That is a clear benefit of eye racing over R Factor 2, for instance, which is obviously my best reference. Um, so they have really, really done a solid job. Again, I would probably say a little bit overdone, not 100% perfect or not 100% accurate everywhere. But generally speaking, as a, as a whole feature, they really got it bang on. And uh, they, I mean, they took their time, but what they delivered in the end is like really a solid result, I guess. And then last but not least, speaking about Assetto Corsa Competizione and the Nordschleife that has been released and has been celebrated big times. I've just had a look onto the player numbers. So ACC went from 4.5 to 5K to like 12K in the beginning of the week, gradually coming down to 10K, so a clear hype uh, about ACC going on there. And I actually enjoyed it, uh, which is a bit odd when you see me enjoying something around the Notch Life, because as much as I'm German, as much as I hate the Nürburgring Notch Life with a passion, uh, yeah, I've dr driven on it for real life two times and I kind of get where the enthusiasm is coming from. But as a sole racer, as one that wants to have competition, that wants to fight for positions and, and have good racing, I think it's an awful track. I think it's so bad. Uh, like 157 corners, 150 of them you can't really try to do an overtake. Um, yeah, I'm just not a big fan of going 21 kilometers around a lap to me my desired lap distance is like really minute and a half between minute and a half and two minutes uh, i don't like sub minute one um, lap time tracks but yeah maybe i'm just an odd f1 fan being way too full of f1 and grand prix racing in that regard about the quality, I think uh, it's a good laser scan. It is um, an accurate redesign of the track. Um, displays a lot of detail. Actually wasn't too bad in general on, on, on FPS. I think it's more of an ACC issue that I had with the FPS, but the overall racing on it is, is nice. I think the grass has too much grip. A couple of times I've dipped the wheel into the grass and I was like, I'm not really dying here, whereas in real life you would have really died. Um, beyond that, the, the usual ACC physics um, issues that I feel are being an issue um, have occurred, like the way the car handled sounds, feels over curbs and so on. Uh, that is obviously still there, and especially on the Notch Life with those big and huge curbs is an, an well, is it a problem? Well, like it is an, an, an issue at least, um, personally. But um, by the looks of it, it is obviously a really, really well done design. For ACC standards, I think it's an extremely accurate and extremely great track. Um, it's a great model. I think it's a bit expensive for 13 euros, 
Um, I remember they have released a couple of GT packs or a new track pack with a couple of GTs on, on top as a, um, as a feature or as a, as a DLC for between 12, 15, 20 euros or something like that. So 13 euros for a single track is a bit... Mm, if you, Yeah, okay, we're not talking about a single track, I say, we're talking about Nordschleife, but still... Um, Relatively spoken, I think that's quite a bigger price indeed. And yeah, I mean, for me personally, I, I had to get it because I wanted to do a stream on. Um, I maybe will even do another race on, uh, as we have obviously done, a one hour race on it. But uh, perhaps you're going to do that more often in the future. Um, yeah, I mean, now that I have the DLC, we probably have to use it or should use it, right, to, to make it work. Anyway, guys, what is your thoughts, especially on the iRacing update and the, the ACC, a new DLC with an Arch Live? Let me know down in the comments area below. Um, if you have any more questions or generally want to want to comment something about what I said for FSR and VEC, also put it down in the comments area below. We're going to have some uh, questions answered there, of course. And uh, beyond that, guys, uh, have a great April. See you there and I'm um, looking forward to see you for a special version of Michi's eSport Diaries as anticipated. I've already spoken about it in March, uh, but it's going to come mid of April. Guys, have a good one. See you. Bye-bye.